If you're watching this video, you probably have already seen my videos on the biochemical cycles when I do a little bit of an overview about the main steps of each of the, of the cycles. And in this video, I just wanted to talk about some general things about that. Remember that we use the word reservoir when describing the location where these chemical compounds tend to stay over a long period of time. For example, the nitrogen is mostly going to be in the atmosphere because that's the place in the world where most of the nitrogen is at. And remember we said that if there wasn't for nitrogen fixation, you would probably never really have substantial amounts of nitrogen in the earth. So normally, those nitrogen fixating bacteria are a limiting factor in ecosystems because if you don't have enough nitrogen fixation going on, you don't have the nutrients which are necessary for the ecosystem to sustain itself. Very important thing. For carbon dioxide, the majority of the carbon is going to be located in rocks. Carbonate rocks are going to be the most common place for, for carbon dioxide on Earth. But there's also a substantial amount of carbon dioxide in the water. The water holds more carbon dioxide than the air does. And there's, of course, carbon dioxide in the air. There's, when it comes to the water cycle, certainly the oceans are the greatest reservoir in the world. Second, basically, would be the clouds and maybe a little bit of groundwater. But Oceans are definitely the greatest reservoir in nature. For carbon dioxide, there's also, of course, a lot of carbon, not carbon dioxide, but carbon stored inside of the sugars and all the structures of all living things because all living things are made of organic compounds which are based on carbon. So that's also an important reservoir for carbon, but not even close to the amount of carbonate and carbonate which is in rocks. And as far as phosphorus goes, that too is going to be a mineral, and most of the phosphorus is going to be in, in sediments or rocks. Now, one biggest difference between all of these cycles is where, how fast the nutrients will cycle through these things. Now, just think about the nature of these areas where the nutrients will going to go. Remember, the nutrients will be going to the hydrosphere, the geosphere, the atmosphere, and the biological you know, area, which is the biosphere. Now, which one do you think will allow the, the, those things to cycle through the fastest. Well, obviously the air is moving constantly at speeds that are never going to be matched by anything else on Earth. And so that means that nutrients which are carried in the air will tend to spread around the Earth faster, which means the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, even the carbon cycle, those will take faster. Those nutrients will cycle faster since they involve the air. Meanwhile, the phosphorus cycle that does not involve the air will be very slow, which is again why the phosphorus is using a very strong limiting factor in ecosystems, because it takes a very long time for that to cycle. Now, nutrients will actually spend a very short time in life forms, because remember, life forms tend to die. Now, even if you eat and uh, or if you are a plant and you get that as a, as a from the root of your plants and then you incorporate to the plant and an animal eats you and an animal eats you and another animal eats you and another animal eats you, ultimately that carbon is going to end up in the air through cell respiration or back by the decomposers into the soil, where it's going to spend most of its time. So it's going to be very rare for carbon to spend that much longer in life. If you trace the amount of time the carbon spends from one plant into the very fine part where it ends up either in the air or in the land, it's not going to be that long. So carbon does not spend too long in life forms. It spends most of its time in the air or in the rocks or in the water. Now in the water too, nutrients will cycle a little bit faster since the water moves around a lot. And that's actually very important because compared to the land where nutrients have to cycle through life forms which have to move from one place to the other, in the water kind of like in the air, but of course there's nothing really living in the air, you know, birds have to land at some point. In the water, unlike the land, the nutrients can be carried from one place to the other, which means they can cycle through faster than they do in the land. So you will find that the water ecosystem is going to be, have a larger turnover, where those nutrients can go back from the decomposers to the producers a lot faster than they would in land ecosystems when they rely on other things like detrovores and aeration and rains and erosion and a lot of other things to get the nutrients back to where they need it in the plants. So aquatic ecosystems will have a faster nutrient cycling than land ecosystems will have. Now which one is the slowest moving of all? The geological parts of the cycle. Erosion, deposition, uh, uplift, volcanic activity, these are things that take centuries, sometimes thousands and thousands and thousands of years to occur. 
All right, so understand that depending on where the nutrients is being involved, it's going to be faster. And the cycles that involve gaseous stages will be faster than the cycles that do not. A little bit about the water cycle that we did not talk last time, also consider advanced. What drives the water cycle is the idea that this greatest reservoir is going to be the ocean. But notice that the water cycle that's pictured in the screen, the water seems to be going from the, from, the, from the oceans to the land and then back. Now, this is only possible because the amount of water that evaporates from the ocean is less than the amount that rains over it. What that means is that by the time the water gets to the land, the, those clouds, the evaporation from the ocean, there's still some water left. That means it, water evaporates from the oceans and it does rain on the oceans too. It's the most common place for rain to fall. 71% of the surface is covered with oceans. But not all of the rain falls right back on the oceans. If it did, there wouldn't be any water cycle the way you see in the screen. It would just be from the oceans to the air and back to the oceans. But the amount of precipitation that falls on the oceans is smaller than the amount of evaporation that falls, that comes from the oceans. That is what drives the water cycle. And then this is going to continue towards the land. Okay. Now, another thing that's important about this is that the rocks of the land will slow down the water cycle substantially because the rocks will block the flow of water sometimes. And that means that a lot of times water will spend a long time on land and sometimes even evaporate again as opposed to returning to the ocean as fast as you would think. Not all the water goes straight back to the ocean. Uh, another thing that's to do with the water cycle is the idea that sometimes water stays frozen in glaciers. And there it will stay for thousands of years as well. Finally, water cycle also carries salt towards the oceans. And it makes the oceans saltier over long periods of time. Because as water evaporates from the oceans, the, the water, water goes, but the salt stays behind. And when water cycle continues and, and the water eventually goes back to the ocean, it comes carrying even more salts. And as the cycle repeats over and over, the ocean gets saltier and saltier over time. Another interesting concept about these biochemical cycles is that these elements can spend a long, long time in certain reservoirs and that at the same time, they are the same elements that have been here for a very, very long time. We can be breathing the same air that was part of the dinosaurs. We can have the same carbon that used to be in a fossil fuel now, but that fossil fuel was a, was a tree from millions of years ago. And these elements are constantly cycling in the ecosystem. While the energy, though, did not cycle. Remember, new energy is constantly inputted from solar power and the heat of the core to, to make the cycles go on. Because matter transfers require energy. But this energy needs to be constantly inputted into the ecosystem. But the cycle itself has been going on for a very, very long time. And these elements spend a long, long time between each of these steps. But remember that elements that have a gaseous phase will tend to cycle faster than the ones that do not have a gaseous phase. And these, those elements will take a long period of time to, to cycle and to be distributed. Which means there's going to be some areas which are going to be, have more of that than others. Minerals which do not have a gaseous phase will be unevenly distributed in the surface of the earth, which is why some ecosystems will be richer than others. Because some ecosystems will have more phosphorus, they will have more calcium, more magnesium, more, more potassium, more sulfur. Whatever element does not have a gaseous state will be more likely to be unevenly distributed, causing some ecosystems to be more peculiar than others in terms of that. Also remember that in order for eutrophication to happen, and we talked a little bit about that before, you're going to need both an excess of nutrients. And that those typically the two most important nutrients for that are going to be nitrogen and phosphorus. Especially phosphorus, since phosphorus is even more limiting than nitrogen is. There's plenty of nitrogen in the air, and nitrogen fixating bacteria exist in pretty much every ecosystem on, on Earth, allowing that to nitrogen to not necessarily be limited on ecosystems. They can be added at the very least by that bacteria. But since phosphorus is a non-gaseous element, ecosystems rely on a very slowly cycling procedure and on the luck of the phosphorus coming to that area, which is unevenly distributed. Remember, phosphorus is a non-gaseous element, meaning phosphorus is usually even more limiting than nitrogen is. So usually when eutrophication happens, it's happening because of a combination of nitrogen and phosphorus excess, but especially phosphorus, which is why modern agriculture, adding phosphorus to the soil is something to worry about because runoff from that 
may cause excessive eutrophication of lakes and oceanic coastal areas, which will cause several problems for those ecosystems. So these are some advanced concepts on, on biochemical cycling, which we hadn't talked about before. And I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you in the next video.